Hello, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Good. Good to be with you today. And it's exciting that you're talking to us from the ship, the 806 foot Honorable James L. Oberstar, named after the Minnesota congressman who was a champion of the Great Lakes. So I'm hoping that, you know, if technology um, works out for us, that you'll be able to give us a sneak peek of the engine room, maybe, if, uh, if we have time. Does that sound good? That sounds good. Uh we can uh, go around the stern of the of the ship here and look around. Uh, you can see how we live, uh, some of our rooms, uh, whatever you want to see. Great. That sounds wonderful. I can't wait. And uh, so I thought we could start out with, you know, how did you decide to become an engineer? I think you told me something you always wanted to be. Um, you were born and raised in the Motor City, uh, Detroit, Michigan. And uh, so tell us a little bit about how you wanted to get into this. Uh, well, uh, I was born in 1974, and I think it was uh, 1980 or 81, my family went on a um, uh, vacation to Washington, D.C. Um, when we got home, uh, everybody got really sick. Uh, I don't remember if my mother got sick first or my brother. My mother had a real bad pneumonia. My brother had some sort of infection and uh, he was in the hospital for quite a while and the doctor gave him penicillin and it almost killed him. Come to find out he's very allergic to it. Then uh, I was next, I came down with uh, spinal meningitis. Um, I was in the hospital for a while too. And uh, there was a, a nurse at the hospital. Uh, I couldn't have any visitors or anything because I was uh, sick. Uh, so. I was just a kid, I was scared. So this uh, nurse stayed with me for a while in my room. And um, A Night to Remember was on. And uh, we, she sat and we watched that together. And uh, from that point on, I wanted to work on, on, on a ship. And um, my uh, parents used to take me down, uh, you know, being in the Detroit area, uh, down, um, the shore of uh, Lake St. Clair to watch the ships go by. And uh, in the summertime, we'd take a, a vacation up to uh, the Sioux Locks, the Sioux, to, uh, you know, Sault Ste. Marie, and watch the ships go through. And it just, uh, it just stayed with it since I was a little kid. And that's what I wanted to do. That's great. And so tell us, so you went through high school and then um, you attended a Great Lakes Maritime Academy in Traverse City. Um, and so you, when you go to the academy, you can choose one of two routes. You could be, you could go engine or you could go deck. So you never had any question that you were going to be working in the engine room, that you wanted to be an engineer, right? That's correct. I, I always liked, uh, working with stuff. Um, part of, uh, that story with my parents or, uh, with the, uh, trip to Washington DC is, uh, shortly after I got better from the spinal meningitis. My uh, father had an uh, aneurysm and um, he wasn't able to uh, do things like cut the grass or work on stuff anymore. So, you know, as a kid, that became my job. And um, so I enjoyed working with stuff, working with tools and whatnot. And um, that helped me want to uh, get into uh, becoming an engineer. That's great. So you went through GLMA and graduated in 1996. That's that, correct. Okay. And but while you were there, you did some cadet cadet time um, working on the ships where you get real life experience um, beyond like the state of Michigan, which is the vessel that they have at uh, Great Lakes Maritime Academy. So can you talk a little bit about like how you spent your cadet time, who you what companies you worked with? Sure. Uh, when I was a cadet, they did not have the state of Michigan yet. They didn't have any uh, larger vessels. So we spent all of our sea time um, on commercial uh, lake freighters. Um, I did my initial cadet time on the um, Elton Hoyt, which was an interlake ship. Um, I was there uh, twice, once in the summer of uh, 94 and another time in, a, I, I think it was like December or January of uh, December 94. Then I spent uh, more time on the uh, George A. Stinson. It, 
at the time Interlake was managing that for a national steel company. Then um, spent a, the rest of my cadet time on the uh, K Barker. So uh, all, all of my sailing time has been with Interlake, whether it be um, you know, cadet time or uh, time as an engineer. Great. And then, so what happened? So you graduated. You didn't go through graduation, but tell us about how you got your first job. This is kind of an interesting story. I I had done all my cadet time with with Interlake, and um, I wrote my license. And um, uh, assuming I was passing, I I already had my car packed up. Uh, so after I wrote my license i uh headed home to uh detroit which is what three and a half four hour, four hour drive and as i was pulling up in a driveway um i lived it at home at the time my mother came out with the uh, phone saying interlake steamship is on the phone for you and uh they called wanted me to go to work uh right away uh, originally they said on the jackson there was not any engineer jobs at the time so it was uh, a QMED position, a uh, qualified member of the engine department until uh, engineering position opened up. So um, I didn't even have my license or my Siemens card in my hand at the time. So I said, I'd like to wait until I you know, had my credentials. So they said, okay, we'll put you on the Hoyt. And uh, you know, a couple days later, I was on the Hoyt as a uh, QMED. Then uh, I was, uh, probably about a month uh, as a as a qualified member of the engine department before I started engineering. And uh, the rest of the time just kind of flew right by. <laughs> so you didn't even get to walk through graduation then at the academy, nope. right? No, I was working that day. Get to work, get right at it, right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. Uh, so, um, Maybe this is a good time to talk a little bit about some of the roles that are in the engine engine department. I don't think everybody realizes how many people are working in that department and um, the different types of positions that are available. Okay, uh, a person can, can come out as, um, it used to be, uh, they call it a wiper, which is like the entry level position. Um, we now, we don't carry uh, wipers anymore. We have, uh, they call it a rover, which is uh, basically a person that uh, greases the unloading system, uh, works on the bearings, mostly uh, uh, dirty work in the uh, unloading tunnel. Um, that's the most uh, entry level position in the engine room right now. Then um, after, a uh, certain number of uh, sailing days, uh, they can write a uh, endorsement as a qualified member of the engine department. Um, then they uh, they can sail as a QMED. Uh, there's also a conveyor man, the person at uh, the unlicensed position that uh, runs the unloading system. Uh, they do all the rest of the maintenance on the unloading boom, on the on loop belts, on the, on all bearings. Um, we have um, duty engineers on these uh, periodically unattended uh, engine room vessels, uh, watch engineers on our other ships. Uh, we have uh, day working engineers. Uh, sometimes we have uh, cadets. Uh, um, so yeah, variety of, uh, of positions. Thank you, that's great. I, at this point, I just wanna remind people to use the mute button and also if you can uh, turn off your cameras and that way um, it'll be uh, the chief and I and you'll be able to see the presentation. Thank you. And um, so you came in um, and you were working as a, a QMED originally, um, you said, and then what did you move into like a, a third engineer, third assistant engineer or something like that? Yeah, uh, third assistant engineer would be the uh, first position, uh, you know, the entry level for uh, engineer with a license. Um, then you have to work, I believe it's uh, at least 365 days as a third before you could write your seconds. Um, 
that's all changed a little bit now. Uh, you know, kids when they write their license exam at the in the academies now write their uh, seconds engineer's license, and they automatically uh, get their seconds after they sail uh, as a third for uh, 365 days. Uh, when I did it, each uh, license uh, was uh, separate. So uh, yeah, I started out as a third. Then uh, at the time, uh, there was uh, uh, not many positions available, you know, to uh, to move up as second or whatever. So uh, I sat on my third license for quite a while, longer than normal. But uh, I eventually did write my seconds, then my first, and then my chief license. And as chief, what are your responsibilities? You know, you're, it's like a floating city out there. You're, you're, yeah. uh, you're responsible for a lot of different areas and machinery and equipment on the ship. Can you talk uh, about what those responsibilities are? Yeah, the, um, I'm responsible to make sure that the, uh, the vessel is run in, uh, in a safe manner, all the machinery. Um, it has to be safe, uh, most of all, for personnel. Um, we're also, uh, you know, safe for, you know, the environment with the uh, scrubbers that we use now and uh, um, bilge water treatment and uh, everything else. Um, we have to make sure that the uh, equipment is run safely, you know, by manufacturer's recommendations. Um, I have to supervise the um, crew members of the engine room. Uh, you know, the duty engineer, uh, QMED, conveyor men, uh, whoever, whoever we have. Um, I uh, communicate with the uh, captain uh, on a daily basis. Um, and um, with uh, our office in uh, Middleburg Heights, uh, keep them informed of any uh, machinery issues we're having. Uh, have to make sure all the maintenance is taken care of. Uh, and there's a lot of it. Uh, a lot of our uh, maintenance is done by uh, hours on the machinery now. Uh, make sure all that's done. Um, uh, supervise repairs. Um, you got to make sure we have spare parts. Uh, uh, adequate number of the correct tools. Um, everything has to be run uh, efficiently, economically. Um, uh, just that's basically what you do um, as the chief you have to be uh, immediately available when you're in uh, restricted waters or maneuvering so you, you really have to keep an eye on things uh, you have to make sure that uh, safety equipment is working properly uh, safety valves on boilers uh, over speeds on engines uh, you know emergency shutdowns you have to make sure everything's in uh, proper working order. Um, you have to uh, do your uh, testing for uh, regulatory, uh, you know, Coast Guard and American Bureau of Shipping. Um, there's uh, never a shortage of work to do. You have to make sure the engine room's always clean. Uh, the uh, risk of fires is uh, very minimal. Uh, you want to make sure there's no tripping hazards. You want to make sure everything is uh, as safe as possible so uh, people don't get hurt. That's a big job. You talked about a lot of responsibility. What would you say the hardest part of your job is for you? Uh, the hardest part, lots of times, is um, communication, trying to get through to people what we need. Um, our engines uh, on this ship are uh, they're uh, Rolls Royce Bergen engines. Uh, uh, they're from Norway. Um, lots of times we have to uh, communicate with uh, the factory, uh, uh, you know, looking for uh, recommendations and whatnot, or uh, with our propeller system from uh, which is also from Rolls Royce, but in uh, Sweden uh, and trying to communicate with the uh, different people, there's definitely a language barrier. Um, and that's, that's very difficult. You know, when you're trying to explain or ask for help, they, you know, sometimes there's a, a, a big language issue. 
I can imagine. And um, at this point, I just want to remind people too to use the mute button and to, if they can, turn off their cameras. And uh, so let's advance this slide a little bit. So this is the Oberstar, obviously the ship that you're on right now. And um, you did mention uh, unmanned engine rooms and watch um, engine rooms. So on the Oberstar, you're considered a day working department. Is that right? Can you talk a little bit about how, how the engineers work uh, what your schedule is like, what a typical day is like for you. Okay, uh, we're all considered day workers on here, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean you work the day, but uh, um, <clears throat> we don't stand watches. Uh, our engine room is uh, periodically unattended. Um, typically, you're supposed to go to work at eight in the morning and get done at 4.30 in the afternoon, and that's your day. Um, we have uh, duty engineers um, that uh, take turns uh, having uh, uh, the alarm duty or uh, engine room duty. Um, if there's an issue with some equipment, whether it's a purifier, scrubbers, um, bilge pump, fire pump, you name it, um, an alarm will go off in the duty engineer's room and they would have to uh, silence the alarm, uh, go down to the engine room and uh, find out what the issue is and uh, fix whatever they have to do. Um, on the uh, other ships, the uh, watch standing ships, they have uh, watch engineers. You have a 12 to four watch, you have a four to eight watch and the eight to 12. Uh, that person is down there at midnight till four in the morning and from noon till four in the afternoon and uh like that through through all the watches um we um on the on man boats uh, that's what we call our our type of operation um we go down after hours as needed uh, while we're maneuvering or for repairs or whatnot um uh, that's basically our day Okay, but like you said, your day can be, you have to be in the engine room during confined waters. Um, if there's anything going on, if there's a repair that needs to be done, anything like that, your day is kind of fluid in the sense, but when we talk about unmanned engine rooms, it just means that they're manned for a certain part of the day. And then there's a portion of time when people aren't in there, but like you said, they get the alarms in their rooms. Um, the alarms go right into their staterooms? That's correct. Uh, a non-critical alarm is an alarm like a, uh, you know, a purifier alarm, high exhaust temperature on the engines, uh, uh, low pump pressure. Uh, those are considered non-critical alarms, and that would go off in the duty engineer's room for uh, about two minutes or so. If the alarm is not, not silenced or acknowledged in that two minutes, then um, the alarm would go in everybody's cabin uh, throughout the vessel, including in the pilot house. Um, if you have an alarm, uh, if you have a, a issue, much larger issue, like a engine shuts down or um, a very high level in the bilge, uh, the alarm would go in everybody's cabin immediately and everybody would respond. Um, you know, a fire is one of those situations where it goes throughout the whole entire vessel right away. So, uh, you know, people are called as needed. So there's a lot of safety um, mechanisms in place, um, varying levels of degrees of response time. Um, all those things are kind of built in, which is so important because you don't just work on the ship, you live on the ship. So it's your floating home, it's everything there. One thing that struck me, I know, when I've been in engine rooms is how confined it is. Um, you have to be really good on stairs, <laughs> depending on the engine room. Um, you, you all move so quickly. Uh, you get into these tight spaces, like on this picture here, you're working on the engine, and it's hot. It's hot in the it's engine good. room. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. 
Can you talk a little bit about the surroundings and getting acclimated to, you know, every there's space is at a premium in an engine room. So you have a lot of equipment that you have to fit down there, a lot of tools. Um, you also have to be able to access these things. Can you talk about just the awareness you need in a space like that for hot area, the boilers, this is hot, this is giving off heat. It just, it seems like there's a lot to, to remember when you're, man, when you're maneuvering in the engine room. There is a lot to remember. That, that picture of me there, I'm actually inside one of our engines, um, down inside the crankcase. Um, the, uh, the smaller ships in our fleet, uh, the, the four smaller ships, basically have this same equipment. It's just in different places. So uh, once you get you know used to how the machinery operates, uh, you just have to learn to different locations. The um, Lita Gertha uh, was the first ship uh, our company repowered. Uh, that is an old uh, ocean going, it was a tanker in World War II. So everything is stacked real vertically. You know, there's not much room uh, width wise. So everything's very tall and uh, the layout is completely different. But uh, yeah, it's all the same stuff, just different places. And um, pretty much everything gets very hot, even uh, stuff that, you know, pumps and whatnot get very hot. Uh, of course, the, uh, the engines are always uh, very hot, uh, you know, uncomfortable sometimes but uh yeah you just make use of it you you have to learn your way around because you don't know you know if if there's uh if your engine shuts down and the lights go out you got to be able to find your way out of where you're at in order to uh to help put the plant back online so it, it you, takes quite a while to uh learn your way around how do you manage the heat? I mean, are you constantly hydrating? I mean, you've got to be sweating a lot, especially in the summer months. I know you try to keep some areas open when possible to let some air into the engine room. But, um, you know, how do you manage that? How do you get used to that? Uh, we have a pretty good ventilation system. Uh, you get a pretty good amount of uh, air movement. Uh, we have uh, water coolers uh, throughout the engine room, uh, almost on all the decks in the engine room. So if you need a cold drink of water, they're available. Um, you bring a water bottle with you um, and just stay hydrated. Um, the uh, engine control room is uh, air conditioned, so it does help to uh, take a break once in a while and cool off. Uh, make sure you don't... Uh, uh, overheat and make sure you know the signs of uh, heat stress and heat stroke. Um, watch out for each other. Uh, you know, if you see someone that uh, is turning red or somebody stops sweating when it's very hot, you, you have to say, you, you know, you need to take a break. So uh, you just work through it that way. And when you're talking about the repower of the Lee, that like you said, that was the first um, vessel that we did back in 2006. What work did you do on that? Like how, how were you involved in that project? I was, uh, I was there when we sailed in as the, uh, as a steamer and I was there for almost the entire, uh, repower project. Um, it left as a, as a diesel. Um, I helped a little bit with, you know, if there was something getting piped in somewhere that didn't make sense or would interfere with something else, I would, uh, you know, say something and see if we can get it reworked or something moved around to uh, make it more um, operator friendly. <laughs> So I'm just going to take a minute and ask everyone to mute their microphone and also turn off their camera. It's the little button at the bottom of the screen. 
little microphone button. You just want to turn that off. Someone is just want attention. I don't want to I should wear the slides. I'm just wanting to make sure that everyone holds this PowerPoint presentation. We're having a problem with that. In addition to receiving one hundred and twenty four dollars the bottom of the screen. It's a little microphone. Oh, I think we got it. All right, great. So, um, so these are some of the. So, if hopefully you're seeing this slide, um, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in some of these photos? If you can see it, um, Eric, the Rolls Royce. There is that. Uh, what is that piece of equipment that's being actually lifted into the ship, lowered into the ship? Sure, yeah, the, uh, in the upper left of the photo, that is actually the bull gear. That was the uh, gear that actually brought color on the uh, steamer. Um, the gear was in excellent shape. It's probably, I don't remember the exact size, but it's over 20 feet in diameter. Um, the next photo down is uh, the LP turbine of the ship. Um, when we first found out that um, they were going to be repowering the ship, uh, the engine room crew, including myself, we, uh, we were told to uh, paint lines, color code lines, uh, like uh, red for a fire main and green for cooling water. So when they were repowering, it would be easier for them to know which pipes to take out and which ones to leave. But um, after we got the pipes color coded, we kept painting. And uh, we were told that the Bergens were, were a seafoam green color. So we that was our original attempt at seafoam green is that uh, that turbine casing there. And we painted a, a Rolls Royce emblem on it. We all love steamers and we hated to see them go. And uh, we were kind of hoping that we would trick the company by them seeing a Rolls Royce green inside and then saying, oh, we already got a Rolls Royce, but uh, it didn't work out. But um, yeah, the center photo is uh, when the engines first were uh, dropped into the Leech Agurtha. Um, that's, uh, you know, you can see the uh, smokestack and on, uh, on the dock there. And, uh, yeah, the engine's going in. That was, uh, we never thought all this would work. You know, when they, when we found out they're repowering uh, the Lee, we thought, well, there's no way they'll make all this automated stuff work. Well, they did, and it works really well. So they repowered the rest of the steamers. Uh, they, they put a huge investment into the fleet to make sure that um, everything stays running and runs uh, um, very good. So yeah it worked great and i'm just going to take a moment to remind people to turn off their cameras and make sure that they have the mute button on and so when we're talking about um you know investments and in modernizing the fleet which is something that we did for over a decade and then also added um exhaust gas scrubbers to our vessels and that added, of course, more equipment down in the engine room, more um, more areas for you to manage, and some some challenges here and there. But right now, we're cleaning. It helps us clean these emissions, it's, which is important to do. Um, a commitment we've made as a heavy fuel fleet. So we uh, clean those emissions. So that's that um, plume that you see coming off the ship here. Uh, people will say, "Oh, look at the smoke." But it's it's not smoke, it's steam, right? So it's we almost look more like steamships now, even though we don't have we don't have a steam engine anymore. Right, that is uh, that is just steam coming out of the stack. The the uh, scrubbers uh, cools and washes the exhaust, and that's just uh, the um, uh, the the water. It, and behind us, it rains rains constantly from uh, from the exhaust plume. Um, these engines are, and, and all the repowers are very efficient. You know, they, they burn a very small amount of fuel compared to what they used to as steamers. Um, then even after that, uh, uh, waste heat economizers were put in. Uh, the Leach Agurtha didn't get them, but all the other uh, repowers did. 
So the exhaust uh, going up the stack actually heats uh, boiler water that flashes into steam, uh, heat that would normally be wasted. And we recover a lot of that heat and turn that into steam to heat our rooms, to heat our, our fuel, um, everything we use steam for. Uh, that's all, for the most part, that's all heat that would be lost going up the stack normally. But uh, it's recovered and uh, it's uh, one of the keys to our efficiency. That's a great point. So I think one thing that people don't know a lot about, and it's it's why you're on the ship right now, because obviously our ships are laid up for the season. Our season starts at the end of March, March 25th. We fit out um, March 25th is when the Sioux Locks opens and it closes on January 15th. So that's our our season. But in the off season, when the boats are idled and they're laid up at different ports around the Great Lakes, there's a lot of work. Millions of dollars of investment is happening on these vessels. And that's what you're you're a part of the winter work uh, program right now. You regularly do that. Can you talk a little bit? Uh, I think people would be interested to know what's happening on these vessels even though it looks like nothing, you know, they're idled and tied up at a dock, but there's a lot of work happening aboard. There's a lot of work by uh, the ship's crew. Uh, right now, there's uh, only two of us from the ship's crew on board and also a lot of work uh, going on uh, by uh, shipyard personnel. The work that we do on board uh, as part of the ship's crew uh, involve um, about every four years, we have to uh, overhaul the engines. Um, it's on a, a 20,000 hour um, maintenance schedule uh, that uh, every four years, uh, we pull all the pistons out of the engines, um, hone or replace the uh, cylinder liners, um, new uh, piston rings, uh, new bearings main bearings uh measure clearances everywhere make sure everything is uh good for another couple of years um but that's every four years you you do an overhaul uh, we did not do an overhaul this year uh kay barker did another ship in our fleet that has the uh, rolls royce bergen engines um we just did some uh routine maintenance including uh replacing fuel injectors um replaced uh seals on our uh on our fuel system um some exhaust work on the exhaust manifolds on the engines um verified the uh engine alignment um other than that we we do other work throughout the engine room overhaul pumps if uh if they need need to be overhauled um uh, we open up our uh, boilers for uh uh, inspection with the uh, Coast Guard and American Bureau of Shipping. We also do uh, other projects, uh, piping projects on uh, water systems, steam systems. Um, yeah, whatever whatever we can't really do during the season. Stuff that takes a uh, long time to do is uh, uh, we work on during the season, oh, pardon me, in the winter. Um, the shipyard uh, also has a number of jobs that they do in the winter time when we're laid up. Um, they do a lot of uh, steel renewal in the uh, cargo holds. Uh, this ship was built in 1959. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of old steel on board. Um, the hull is inspected uh, constantly by the Coast Guard and American Bureau Shipping. And uh, it's in a, a lot of the steel is in a renewal program cycle. And uh, that is what uh, one of the big jobs that uh, the shipyard does in the wintertime. Um, about every five years, the ships are dry docked um, and uh, the underwater hull is inspected. Um, repairs are made. Uh, the propeller and shaft is typically uh, removed for uh, inspection and overhaul. Uh, the underwater uh, hull is typically uh, painted. Uh, with an anti-fouling paint, um, a lot of a lot of work goes on in the winter. 
For sure. And then what is it? Do you, you're a Fraser Shipyards right now in Superior, Wisconsin. That's where the boat is, is laid up. Um, so do you stay on the ship? Can you tell people a little bit about the different ways, you know, ship, some ship keep, people live on the ship, some people don't. How does that work? There's uh, right now there's uh, two of us on board. We, we stay on the ship um, and uh, we are running a boiler for uh, basically hotel load is what we call it, which is just uh, hot water uh, and um, steam for heating. Um, we cook for ourselves. We don't have a cook in the wintertime um, or any galley staff. We order groceries and uh, do our own thing. Other ships uh, have uh, ship keepers that will just work the day, then stay in the hotel at night. Um, other ships have uh, ship keepers that just stop by once in a while and live in the area nearby and uh, just stop in on the vessel, check everything, make sure uh, the lines are tight. You know, it all depends on what the uh, what the company policy is as, as far as uh, the way to lay the vessels up. Great. So what are you specifically working on on the Oberstar right now? Uh, right now, uh, we are putting some stuff together, getting ready for fit out. Uh, that'd be the our uh, purifiers, fuel purifiers, lube oil purifiers. Uh, we are, um, over the weekend, we have to get our uh, our main boiler ready for inspection. Um, our economizers are due for inspection. Um, uh, that's pretty much it. We, we've done our coolers already. Um, just uh, other routine maintenance. So when are you not on the ship then? Do you take much time off? I uh, I don't take much time off. I, I'm not married. I don't have uh, have a kid or anything. So um, I enjoy doing what I do. So I don't uh, I don't take much time off. Um, so and it seems like I kind of work harder at home than I do here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it seems weird. Well, there's so many projects left, right? But um, what's the longest you've um, gone between, like, and your work stints? Boy, that's a tough one. Um, I think I worked, I'm going to say, uh, from November or December of uh, 05 all through 06. And I think I took off in uh, April of 07. Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> because you yeah, don't have to take off on the ship, right? Pardon me? It's not like you have a day off on when you're on the ship, right? No, no. Everything is at least an eight-hour day. We don't have, uh, we don't take days off. Uh, there's no sick days. Uh, if you're here, you work. Wow. So tell us about what you're going to be doing next season um, on our new build, uh, the 639-foot uh, Mark W. Barker that's being built in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin at Fincantieri uh, Bay Shipbuilding. So I know you've been involved a lot in helping with that new ship. Um, especially in this past season and which what are you going to be you're not going to be um actually on the oberstar next year you're going to be stationed at the shipyard right that's the plan right now um uh, just to see how the uh, construction's going uh they're at the point in uh, construction where they're uh installing a lot of piping and they're going to be uh, starting the electrical uh, wiring soon um so I was asked to be on hand there for that to assist as needed or or um, or help however I can. Um, I've been on uh, all the uh, smaller repowers. Um, so hopefully, uh, you know, we can learn from that and uh, and try and make it better.
So you have a lot of expertise that you're bringing to this new ship, and um, that's pretty exciting. How does it feel to be a part of um, the ship that's being built, the first new freighter on the Great Lakes in more than 35 years, more in, in your career? definitely on the on the lakes um so how does it feel to be kind of on the ground level helping with a project like that well it's it's it actually uh quite an honor um to be asked to do that uh it, it's a big job it's uh it's a huge investment our company's making and uh to be asked to be part of it is uh you know pretty big deal for me i think that's great and um, so when you aren't on the ship, which doesn't happen very often, um, as we've already established, um, you, what kinds of things do you like to do in that little bit of free time that you give yourself? There's always uh, very long honey-do lists, um, whether it's at, um, uh, you know, at my girlfriend's house in Chicago or, or, uh, or back home. Um, my girlfriend uh, likes gardening and uh, trying to help her out in the garden and clean a lot of strawberries in the, in the summertime when I'm home. Um, yeah, always something to do. Oh, for sure. And this is your girlfriend, Rebecca, on the screen. This is a picture from uh, last year's winter meeting in Florida. Sadly, we're not going to Florida this year, but we'll be doing our spring meetings virtually, like everyone is doing everything virtually, but hopefully we'll, we'll all be able to get together again uh, next year. And then, um, so, and then this is your little, this is, what's your cat's name? Her name is Layla. She's uh, she, she's a Sphinx cat. She's so cute. So um, yeah, I think this is a good time to um, take some questions. We've talked for you know forty five minutes. I think we've covered a lot, but I know that there's been some questions and coming up. So I'll. Uh, shoot this back to Michelle. And at this point, I'll just remind everyone to stay on um, mute and to uh, keep their cameras uh, turned off. And I will turn this back over to Michelle for question and answer. And unless you want to do, try to do the uh, tour of the engine room now, Michelle, what do you think? I'm up for either way. So what Eric, works for you, Eric? Uh, well, if we do the tour now, if there's uh, questions as far as, uh, you know, what something looks like or something, it's easier for me to show you than it probably would be to describe it. So we could uh, probably do that if you want to walk around first. Let's do that. that. Plan. Answer questions from the engine room. Okay. Um, as long as I'm upstairs here, before I go downstairs, uh, I'll, I could show you real quick. Uh, I'm not sure how this would be, but this is how we live. Uh, this is my room. Um, every crew member has their own room. Um, you know, we got a, a, a full size bed. You got a recliner, um, a bathroom. Every Everybody's got their own bathroom. So, you know, we don't have to really share. Um, this is uh, the chief's office. Uh, this is where I do my uh, ordering and hollering at people or, or and, whatnot. Um, Eric, um, while yep. you're there, one of the questions that came in is someone wanted to know what ballpark that is. <laughs> That's a America Park. Uh, being from Detroit, I'm a... Uh, Tigers fan, even though uh, they haven't been doing too well the past couple of years. Um, so we uh, head down to the engine room. I was originally planning on uh, trying to show you the galley too, but uh, there's some work going on up there right now. So that might not go so good. Uh, I'm going to step outside real quick so I can show you where we're at. And then uh, while he's talking, Chrissy, we might have a question that you can answer. Uh, Stuart was asking when the Mark Barker will be making its first voyage. Well, it's uh, we're hoping, you know, the plan is spring of 2022. 
And is Interlake hiring? Shannon was asking that. We are always accepting applications. If you want to go to our website, interlake-steamship.com slash careers, there is an application that you can download and submit to jobs at interlake-steamship.com. So yeah, we're already gearing, even though it feels like the season just ended, we're already gearing up for next season and starting to put our personnel and crew lists together. So this is a great time to put in an application. All right, so this is where we're at. The Lee Tagurtha is directly behind us. You can see that. That's showing up all right? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, the Ryerson is over there. That's not in our fleet, but uh, yeah, the bridge to Duluth. So so you can see where we're at. This is how we uh, tie up in the wintertime, close to other ship. Um, it makes uh, exchange of parts uh, kind of easy sometimes. So we're Eric. Hey, Eric, I don't know what your finger is, but it's yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very important. A foosball table. A lot of the disputes are settled there. <laughs> All right, we're heading downstairs. So, I'll show you what it's like. At this point, we can just make sure and remind people to stay on mute and turn off their cameras. Oh, I don't know if you're frozen, Eric, or Our, uh, engines. Oh, you still like your fingers. <laughs> Wherever, Pardon however me? you're holding it, your fingers are in the picture. Okay, that's there we way go. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry about that. These are uh, Rolls Royce Bergen uh, 3240s. Uh, the uh, camera down. We're just have a bore of uh, 300. The other way. A little more. There, there we go. Okay, now we can okay. see them. Okay. All right. <laughs> the uh, cylinders have a bore of uh, 300 millimeters and stroke of uh, 400 millimeters. Be about 12 and a half by almost 16 inches. Um, we um, we have a machine shop on board uh, that we can work on. Hopefully, most everything that we need to. Uh, selection of tools, drill press, grinders, bandsaws, welders. We have a few things like this. Hey, Eric, I think we're we're breaking up just a little bit, and um, uh, we really didn't see the we didn't really see the machine shop much because the camera's like t I know it's hard because the camera's kind of tilted up. We weren't really able to see much of the tools that were there. And you're on mute. <laughs> okay, well, while Eric works on that, um, he did bring up the point about the machine shop, which is, I was always so impressed when I went on, when I've been on any of the ships. Oh, here we go. Okay. Hey, Eric, you're on mute. Uh-oh. <laughs> but uh, in, until he comes you know back. I, I will make a note that, um, at least from what I've noticed and in, in, in the world in general, but in boats in particular, the internet is not the same everywhere. So I wonder if he might have wandered into a uh, low Wi-Fi area. Maybe. But what he was showing you with the machine shop, when hopefully he's able to get that back up, it's just so well organized. All the tools are hanging in perfect uh, succession. And um, a lot of uh, things have to be fixed on board, of course. They try to fix everything that they can um, when they're out, you know, underway on the, sh on the water. So um, we have a lot of very, uh, smart engineers, people that are very resourceful. That's one of the 
probably top skills, I think, of engineers. They, they're they not afraid to try to tinker something and, and, um, and tackle a challenging problem, find a solution. So we have a fleet of engineers that are just really great at problem solving and um, keeping the um, ships running. Chris, if you want to take a second and text Eric, and uh, yeah. we'll get him back on. And I'm going to go ahead real quick and run through our little preliminary thing, give some people a chance to enter some questions. I know I've seen some of them that I think Chrissy can probably answer for us. And Chrissy will try to get uh, Eric reconnected someplace with a little stronger Wi-Fi signal than apparently in the engine room. Um, currently, our visitor centers in Duluth, Minnesota and Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan are closed, uh, but currently at the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center, they're having vessel arrivals. There's a cell phone tour. Um, at the Sioux Locks, our park is open from 9 to 6. Both of our cooperating associations have online gift shops, and our visitor centers will reopen when we are able to uh, resume uh, safe operations according to local health guidances. Okay, it looks like Eric is back. Can you hear us, Eric? Eric is unmuted. Did you, so you, do you want me to ask a question while we're trying to get Eric back on here? Sure. Um, one of them that did come up is someone had asked if uh, ships always go to the same location for layup every year. Not necessarily. It's depending on the work that needs to be done. Um, gen some, some ships will go to the same one over and over again. The courts usually uh, laid up in Milwaukee. Our tug, Dorothy Ann, Pathfinder, um, she will generally go to Erie. But, um, you know, there's phrase, depending on the work that needs to be done, Fraser and Sturgeon Bay, if there's like a lot of work that needs to be done, steel, new, all that kind of thing. Those are two really uh, big shipyards in the area. I think I think Eric might be back with us. I hope so. Yeah. yeah, I guess we didn't work in the control room, so uh, we tried. <laughs> we well, thank did. you for showing us what you did. Um, uh, right now, I'll run through a couple of the questions that came in, and I will also uh, let people know we're planning to try to get to all of the questions. If we run a little late and you need to leave, we do post the video on our YouTube channel. It's the Detroit District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers channel. And there is a link to it. If you scroll through the chat, you will find that link. Um, one of the questions that Kimmy asked is if you always do winter work. Do you do winter work every year? Or do you sometimes take a winter off? I don't know if we have Eric. Are you there? <laughs> Looks like we're having some technology problems. I think he almost always does work, do winter work, based on what I know of him. So I can kind of answer that one for him. He's a very hard worker. Like he said, he doesn't really take much time off. He skipped his own graduation to go to work. Ah. Uh. Well, so a lot of these are kind of engine room questions, like what determines if a boat has a manned or unmanned engine room? And these are good questions for Eric to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, you know, it's a new world that we live in and we are not all technology experts, I'm afraid. Um, I will put, um, we have actually, Chrissy, what would be a good way if people wanted to send a question? Should I have them email them to me and I'll send them to you? Or do you have a, a good place like on your Facebook page or somewhere else people could post a question and we could go, we could get them answers to people even though our technology is failing? I'll, on our Facebook page, we post, Eric is trying to get back in right now, so I have hope, but in, <laughs> 
if that does not work, um, we had posted on our Facebook page today that uh, he was doing this talk. So you could, uh, they could put a question there and I could try to coordinate um, to have them answered uh, with Eric. Um, so that was, that's one option. Okay. So uh, everybody, uh, if uh, we are unable to get Eric back, go to the Interlake Steamship Company Facebook page and use the post from today and you can post your question there and Chrissy and Eric will try to get answers for you. Uh, and our, our Arlene was asking if it's the Facebook page for Interlake or for the core. This would probably be for the Interlake Steamship Company Facebook page because that will be your most direct way to get that answer. You're welcome to post on our event uh, a link, but uh, if you go straight to the Interlake page, you'll get you'll get a much better response and faster. And uh, I will try to gather all of these questions that have been posted in the chat. This, yeah, it's unfortunate that we lost him, but um, we'll do our best to try to answer the questions. You know, I think this is just a, a typical challenge of living on board. Apparently, even in layup, having a connectivity on board can be a challenge. Mm, definitely, yeah, there are definitely parts of the ship I know when I've traveled on board, they'll be like, you need to be on the port side if you want to get any reception because the starboard side isn't getting any. So it, it can be that specific, like he walking in different areas, completely different connectivity. So I, I, I feel bad because I know he wanted to answer all these questions and he was really trying to give a glimpse of the engine uh, room to people. This was like his idea to give a little tour. So I, yeah, it's unfortunate it wasn't able to come through. Well, um, I'm going to start the wrap up unless Eric gets back. And uh, next, the, our next program will be March 4th. And we will be having Ranger Hannah. She's going to talk about how boats travel from Duluth, Minnesota, all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the uh, Atlantic has uh, always uh, been the recipient of Lake Superior's waters, but that route was not always navigable by vessels. And she's going to talk about some of the history and technology that has gone into making this a, uh, a thoroughfare for cargo ships. Uh, the program after that on the 18th is about the evolution of vessels. So we have two great maritime programs coming up for March. And then, uh, you can see the address linked right there. And I will post that in the chat in just a second. Got to find my right clickable here. Also that event will be um, posted to the Army Corps of Engineers Facebook page. So we will have that uh, available a little closer to that time. Someone's asking if uh, Mark's father is Jim. I presume they mean James Barker and mm -hmm. Mark. All right, James R. Barker is his father, yes. And uh, several people have commented, despite the tech issues, it was a great program. Uh, also, uh, we have posted a link to our survey. Oh, it says, no, I work with Eric. So I'm not sure. Oh, the uh, different, different mark. OK, gotcha. What is and my favorite what? ship? They're oh. trying to get her in trouble. <laughs> You know, yeah, do you know how much trouble I would get with that? I get asked that a lot. I have nine favorite ships. Um, I I would say that I've been, I've traveled the most on the Lee H. Gertha, which he showed us. Um, she's the, you know, World War II veteran. She has uh, medals on her bow uh, outside the pilot house. So, um, or forward house. So she is just a beautiful ship. Um, 826 feet. She's one of the most altered vessels on the Great Lakes. 
And uh, I've just, for whatever reason, I'm taking a lot of media aboard and photographers aboard. And Michelle, we were on the Lee once. So um, it's a great, great vessel. But I like um, I like the smaller boats um, the, with the forward pilot house, and I like the footers, the thousand footers. So I've been on almost all the ships. So they all have um, their positives. So I don't I don't have a favorite. My favorite is all the ones I've been able to go on. That's a good answer. <laughs> there's, uh, there's something about when when you get to go on board and you get to meet the people that live and work there and you get to hear their stories and somehow makes the boat more special, which is how Chrissy has nine favorite boats. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't well, know if there's any other question. Oh, look, it's Eric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, our uh, Wayne kind of let me down, our uh, IT guy, but uh, I'm on my cell phone now, so uh, we'll try that. Okay. Well, this resourceful engineer. There we go. We we did our best to entertain the people while we waited for the star to return. Okay. We have quite a lot of questions here. Um, uh, Donna is asking, what determines whether a boat has a manned or unmanned engine room? That's all certifications in the level of automation that the. Um, uh, company, uh, you know, when they repower a ship or uh, when they build a ship, uh, the level of automation will de determine um, if the engine room would be manned or unmanned. Uh, to be uh, unmanned, you'd have to have an alarm panel similar to this uh, in the duty engineer's room, a common space, and in the pilot house. Um, on this alarm panel, this will, this is what, uh, would send the alarm to the duty engineer's rooms uh, so you can uh, tell if there's a malfunction somewhere or not. Um, on this panel, you can um, um, this is your propulsion system. So you got both main engines here. You got your reduction gear, your controllable pitch propeller. Um, there, screens like this, and uh, that's what. Uh, uh, allows us to uh, be on manned as uh, the alarms will come to our uh, quarters. And um, what safety protocols do you have in the engine room to protect vision and hearing? Uh, we have uh, different types of uh, hearing protection. Um, it just depends. People can use whatever they want to. We have uh, 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 quite a big selection of different types of uh, over-the-ear or uh, in-ear uh, hearing protection. Um, I think some of the stuff has, uh, it's around a 30 decibel noise reduction. Uh, for uh, vision, uh, we're all required to wear uh, safety glasses. Um, I don't have mine on right now because I'm in my room. Um, we also have uh, face shields uh, and uh, and such like that. Hopefully that answers that. I think so. Uh, someone else was asking if uh, your boat goes to the ocean. No, uh, being 806 feet long, we're too big to fit out to the ocean. Um, the only ships we have right now that uh, are capable of going out that way are the uh, Herbert Jackson and our uh, Tug Barge Pathfinder. Um, the Mark W. Barker uh, will be uh, small enough to be able to get out to Seaway when it's uh, finished in 2022. Now, is that something that happens very often with those boats that do fit? No, um, the Jackson went to, uh, I think it was Quebec City um, in 2016, I think twice. Um, I know the Pathfinders made that run uh, quite a few years ago. Um, on the Hoyt, we went out to, uh, not to the ocean, but to uh, Oswego, New York, that's uh, on Lake Ontario. But uh, uh, yeah, they don't. Uh, there aren't too many trips out that that way for us. Uh, you know, if 
we had more vessels that were uh, able to go out that way than our marketing department would definitely be able to uh, try and pick up contracts in that area. And uh, Joe is asking if the court will be getting exhaust scrubbers at some point. The court only burns uh, number two fuel, uh, which is uh, ultra low sulfur. So they should not have to have scrubbers uh, in a, in a, anytime soon. And uh, someone suggested that you get a better Wi-Fi booster. <laughs> yeah, well, they'd have to talk to our IT guy, Wayne, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, which is probably working too good now. So now um, now everybody hates Wayne. Poor Wayne. <laughs> yeah, they're joining the club. <laughs> but um, and, go ahead. Uh, the, our new uh, ship, the Mark W. Barker, is going to have uh, EMD engines. Uh, the court has EMDs, and uh, so does the uh, the tug for the tug barge. Um, <clears throat> the Mark W. Barker will be uh, the latest tier for the EPA compliant, and will have a uh, diesel exhaust uh, uh, treatment system, uh, urea system, uh, to uh, um, to uh, uh, clean the exhaust, uh, but it won't be a scrubber. And then um, Peter is asking if there's an advantage to a tug barge versus a regular kind of ship. The uh, tug barge, uh, the manning requirements are different and uh, quite a few different uh, uh, rules that apply to regular ships that don't apply to uh, tug barges. Um, tug barges can be more flexible uh, if you have probably more of them. Um, but that's just not the way that our company uh, decided to go. You know, they uh, uh, converted the Mothy into the uh, uh, Pathfinder, I'm going to say, uh, what, 1997 or something like that, 96, 97. Uh, and that's the only one we have so far. I know other fleets have uh, had quite a few tug barges, but that's just not the uh, way we um, I'm not. I've never worked on one. So I'm not uh, all too familiar with them. And uh, Jim is asking why the Barker is so short. I presume he means the Mark and not the, the James R. The Mark Barker is a, a very special size to get into a dock in a Cuyahoga River. Uh, there's a, I believe it's a Cargill, uh, is a, a real big, uh, they're really pushing us to, uh, to come up with this new vessel. Uh, that's going to be special for the salt trade. It's going to have special coatings in it, special equipment for uh, working with the salt. And uh, this boat is being specifically made for this trade pattern, but it's also very flexible where it can handle cargoes of different types. It can handle, you know, windmill parts, steel coils, you know, pretty much uh, any type of uh, uh, larger bulk cargo. And uh, one of our guests is asking, what is the service speed of the Oberstar and what's the fastest you've ever seen her run? The Oberstar is uh, not terribly fast. Um, we'd be typically around 16 miles an hour, um, light or loaded, uh, sometimes a little more. Some, it depends on the wind and the waves, uh, but usually right in the 16 mile an hour range. And what's the fastest uh, boat in the Interlake fleet? It used to be the Lee. Uh, when I was on the Lee, when it was a steamer, we had that thing up to, um, um, in the Straits, I, it was just shy of 19 miles an hour. Uh, Jeff is asking, with social media being so popular and you being away from home, do you or the crew ever do things like the ALS Ice Challenge or, or done other kinds of challenges that uh, take off on social media? I've seen people do it, but I've, I have not done that. Okay. Um, John is asking, do you ever train with fire departments in ports? As a port city, there are several ships come in for a short period and leave. The fire department was called for a fire on a ship last year, and recently the fire on the Blau. What's the best way to understand the hazards firefighters 
and honestly, uh, uh, crew members can face from fire. We do train uh, with the uh, uh, local fire departments. Uh, this uh, Superior and Luth uh, fire departments uh, was supposed to come down to the yard, uh, I think two weeks ago, but uh, that was postponed uh, for now. Um, we used to train uh, with, uh, in the Detroit area uh, with the uh, fire department. Um, we have um, on board, you know, we have uh, a fire detection system throughout our machinery spaces, um, and that is capable of sounding the, uh, you know, general alarm throughout the whole ship. We have um, uh, fire suits uh, similar ex to what the uh, fire departments wear with the uh, self-contained breathing apparatus. Um, we have uh, confined space extraction gear uh, crew members are trained uh, in crew member extraction and firefighting. Uh, there's a firefighting school that uh, two of our uh, uh, crew members from this ship uh, were just at. Uh, one of the guys uh, hopefully will be the chief on here next year. He was the, just there last week. And also the uh, QMED, who is my shipkeeping partner, was there also. So uh, we do uh, the company does put us through uh, uh, training um, and uh, yeah, it works very good. Okay. And uh, Tom is asking, are you familiar with the term hinge referring to a stress concentration area about two thirds aft, particularly on the old straight decker? Is that a, still a thing on cell phone loaders and thousand footers? I've not heard of the hinge, but the, you do see the ships working quite a bit. Uh, the ships are long and narrow, and uh, when it gets choppy out, you do see the hulls bend quite a bit. Uh, we don't typically go out in uh, too bad of weather anymore. Uh, with all the uh, weather prediction uh, systems out there, uh, and the ships are getting older, uh, they don't beat up the ships like they used to. So we don't do as much working as we used to uh, in the heavy seas. Okay. And um, Arlene is asking if the ship has bubblers around the hull. And uh, if not, are you in a dry dock? We are not in a dry dock. Uh, we have a little propeller bubbler uh, by our propeller that keeps a little bit of open water there. But we also uh, put compressed air into all of our uh, sea chests that we're not using. Uh, any sea chest that would just have water sitting in it, uh, we uh, use compressed air uh, in the wintertime. And what does that do? That just that... bubbles. It, it just bubbles okay. the water. So you use the, the ship's sea chest, which that's the same as the ballast tank, correct? Uh, ballast tank are the tanks uh, that would carry uh, water when we're light. Uh, okay. That would wait. The sea chest is where we take uh, suction with our cooling water or ballast pumps, fire pumps. That's the what we call the the uh, sea suction. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, what are the are Interlake's plans for the John Sherwin? That depends on the day of the week. Um, <laughs> oh, we've not really, but uh, they've been talking about uh, uh, the Sherwin on and off since I started. Uh, I know there's drawings out of uh, converting it to a self unloader. Uh, the engine room equipment, machine spaces was all gutted um, around the same time that the uh, Oberstar was uh, repowered. The ships are uh, very close in the same design hulls. Uh, originally, the uh, Sherwin was uh, towed to uh, Sturgeon Bay Shipyard and was supposed to be uh, out in, uh, I believe, 08, 08, 08 09. And uh, the economy tanked uh, in 08. So the uh, project was put on hold and they ended up using the uh, the equipment that they bought for the Sherwin on the Cape Barker. Um, but there's there's always rumors about uh, the Sherwin uh, being used for uh, as a barge, as a tug barge. 
a, a um, you know, converting it to a self unloader. Uh, it does have some uh, issues uh, that they found in the dry dock. I thought with uh, some plating, but I, I, you know, I we just hear rumors. We don't hear anything official. Okay. And uh, someone else, Taylor, is asking if the jobs on board are union or non-union or a mix. We are all uh, union. Uh, the um, engineers and mates are uh, from uh, our unions called uh, MEBA, Marine Engineers Beneficial Association. The unlicensed are um, uh, steel workers on here. Some, uh, some fleets use uh, AMO for their officers, American Maritime Officers, and some fleets use SIU, the Siemens uh, International Union, for uh, unlicensed positions. And uh, someone was asking Christy if there's any new news on the new build. Well, we floated her out in December, so um, she was in the dry dock at Fincantieri, and um, so they moved her to another part of the shipyard um, so that they could bring uh, the winter fleet in and focus on that, although still work is being done on the new new build. Um, the pilot house was is getting being constructed, so they moved that. That should be um, being put together soon. Um, but yeah, that's full speed ahead on her construction and she's coming to, it's coming along really well there. And uh, a question for Eric here from Bruce. Uh, what redundancy, redundancy do you have for major equipment failures? Uh, well, you can uh, cross systems over to other systems. Um, you can, we have two engines going into one gearbox um, for for propulsion. So if you lose one engine, you still have half your available horsepower um, to the propeller. We have uh, three uh, fire pumps on board. Um, we have uh, two ship service generators in addition to the two shaft generators that we use. We have an emergency generator. Uh, we have um, uh, two uh, different pump systems to control our uh, propeller pitch, um, different uh, fuel pumps, uh, separate fuel pumps, separate uh, feed water pumps, and economized or circulating water pumps. Uh, water pumps can be uh, run from the ballast. Uh, there, there is quite a bit of redundancy. Okay. Um, someone has asked a question, says, do you know the story about Interlake subsidiary lakes shipping that the Lee A. K. E. were part of? Then in, um, I think it was 1989, um, Interlake took over uh, what used to be the Ford fleet. So that was the, uh, the William Clay Ford became the Lee Tagurtha. The Benson Ford became the um, K Barker, and uh, the uh, Henry Ford became the Samuel Mather, but that I don't believe sailed. I think that was uh, 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 taken out of service shortly after. Um, I don't remember why they had their own, uh, why they made it their own subsidiary, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't really know the story, but I know, remember when it happened. Okay. And uh, Tom has also, uh, in addition to thanking you for being so comfortable talking and, and answering questions, uh, has asked a question, which is probably uh, would be a joint effort between Eric and Chrissy, is if you could post some stills on your Facebook page of what we were unable to see in the engine room and the machine shop. Yeah, sure. I, I don't know exactly when it cut out, but uh, it was worth a try, but yeah, we can. I can send pictures to uh, Chrissy and. I'm sure, I'm, saying, I'm sure Chrissy could make a post of highlights of the uh, Overstar engine room. Yeah. <laughs> if you can get her those pictures, uh, Taylor's sure. asked, "What is the average uh, personnel size of the engine department?" I, I presume she means in terms of the staff and not individual sizes. Right. Yes. Uh, we would normally have the chief, 
two assistant engineers, one QMED, and a conveyor man is our typical crew. A uh, typical okay. crew on a ship would be about 21 people. So, you know, crew sizes have uh, decreased over the years with the repowerings. Okay. And do crews go ashore in ports when you're there? If you have the opportunity, uh, you can go up to yes. But with the um, reduced manning, uh, you know, there are so few positions uh, out here right now. Uh, when we get to port, we're almost always working on something. And even if you do have the opportunity to, uh, you know, go uptown and buy toothpaste, go to dinner, whatever you got to do, um, you don't have that much time. You know, six hours is about the limit. Uh, one thing that's really helped out is like Amazon. You know, every time we go to the Sioux, there's always a ton of packages delivered. Um, and that's really helped uh, people not having to go uptown. And I'll just jump in here. I think that um, he makes an interesting point, like, you know, five, six hours when you're talking about a smaller boat with a smaller cargo um, amount of cargo, maybe 25 to 28,000 tons on our larger vessels, on our thousand footers, they could have, you know, 60 to 70,000 tons. So their unloading time is a lot longer. It could be 10 to 12 hours. So it, it really depends like on the vessel and the department size and and all of that and i i presume too that in most ports uh the place that you're tying up the boat to load or unload is not like right across the street from a shopping mall or a restaurant yeah it's a little bit of a walk uh sometimes <laughs> get off the ship just to uh just to get away for a little bit uh marquette is a good town for that uh two harbors is really nice um when we go to Detroit or uh, Indiana Harbor, it's pretty industrial and there's really nowhere to go close. And uh, one question someone had is, is it true that the quarters are more private on the older vessels as compared to the newer footers? I think they're about the same. Um, some of the ships, um, some of our thousand footers, uh, for a while, I think deck department people might have had to uh, share rooms. Uh, maybe the second cook and porter had to share a room. Um, but I think most of the crews have been uh, cut back by elimination of some of the Q meds or uh, watchmen. So I, I think everyone has their own room now. Okay. And uh, someone's asking who's going to be taking your spot when you move to the Mark Barker? Well, we're hoping that the uh, person that has been the uh, first assistant on here for the past couple of years, he, uh, he does an excellent job on here. And I don't think uh, the company could make a better decision than to put him over here. Okay, and here's a question that I'm just gonna have to read word for word because I'm not a gearhead and uh, I don't understand what I'm repeating here. Uh, why are none of the ships on the Great Lakes using the low RPM engines with direct drive to the propeller? This would remove the need of the reduction gear and leave more room for other equipment. You would, uh, most of those are uh, none or uh, reversing engines. So you would actually have to stop the engine and uh, restart it in the stern direction. We do so much maneuvering here, whereas on the ocean, you're pretty much running, uh, you know, uh, at a set speed all the time. We do, we're maneuvering every day, and that just wouldn't be uh, very beneficial to us. I think some of the uh, Canadian ships have uh, uh, slow speed engines, uh, but uh, I'm not aware of any on the American side. Uh, most are uh, medium speed with the uh, gearbox. And I had just one, uh, a very basic question in kind of general terms. I'm curious how um, the the job in or the work in the engine department has changed from the time you first started as a recent graduate to how it is now in terms of, you know, how hard is the work, how dirty is the work, um, how safe is the work compared to what it was when you started more than 20 years ago? 
Well, I think it's a lot safer than it was, and I'm not saying that it wasn't safe before. It always has been. You know, I think uh, working out here is uh, probably safer than people having to drive to work every day. Um, the workload has changed uh, just because there's people. Um, when I first started, this, of course, was a steamer. The You know, half the ships in our fleet were steamers. And uh, there was uh, not much maintenance required. You just had to keep it running. Um, unfortunately, it, it wasted a lot of energy. It, it burned a tremendous amount of fuel, and it just wouldn't be uh, uh, competitive. So with the repowers, uh, we you know burn a lot less fuel. There's quite a bit more work. You do stay very busy. Uh, but it's manageable. Um, it's not any dirtier than it ever has been. Uh, yeah, it, it's changed, but really not that much. And uh, another uh, person is asking: Does the Overstar and Sherwin, or do the Overstar and Sherwin have any other sister ships? No. Nope. Just those two. The hulls were the same, but the uh, machinery arrangements were different. Um, uh, they were quite a bit different. Uh, so, yeah, they weren't exact sisters. Okay. And uh, how's the food on the Overstar? For the past couple of years, we've had an outstanding cook. Uh, she does an excellent job. Um, I'd have to say she is probably the best cook that I'm aware of out here. Um, <laughs> We have had um, some uh, less than spectacular cooks, uh, <laughs> in, but uh, the the cook we have had, we got very lucky with with her. She does an excellent job. She seems to love what she does, and uh, she's she's excellent. And uh, Bruce is asking, what happens if there's a medical problem on board? Uh, if there's a medical issue. Uh, the uh, the captain uh, would of course call uh, you know sometimes the company doctor for advice but uh, they uh, they also would call uh, the coast guard as needed uh, for uh, airlift if needed uh, and uh, the coast guard has been practicing uh, landing the helicopters on our decks as we move um, they did on here I think it was la last year I think. Um, other than that, you know, we can, uh, pull up to, uh, a dock and, uh, a person get, get picked up by ambulance or, uh, another smaller Coast Guard vessel and taken ashore. We can also treat stuff. You know, we have, uh, splints on board. We have, uh, a variety of other, uh, you know, first aid equipment. Um, we have, uh, AEDs on board. Um, uh, it just depends on, uh, the nature of the emergency. And uh, Virginia and Carl are asking if you're able to have your kitty on board with you. Uh, she would like it here in the summertime because it, it does get kind of warm. But in the wintertime, uh, no, she would uh, put a little sweater on her. She'd be, she would still be frozen. But uh, <laughs> and her little get dirty. So, um, yeah, no, she, she wouldn't like it out here. Okay. And um, someone is asking, what is the long piece of metal that sticks off the bow of all classic Lakers for? That's for steering. Um, when they're, I, I assume you're talking about the steering pole, but when we're so. going down, okay, when you're going down rivers or whatnot, sometimes the captain will tell the, or the mate will tell the uh, wheelsman to uh, steer on, on a, on a particular light, on a smokestack, on a, on a tree sometimes, and uh, they just keep that pointed at whatever they're steering at rather than uh, steering by, uh, you know, a compass bearing. And um, do newer vessels have them? Like, do the footers have steering poles? 
I no, I don't think they, they don't have a steering pole, but they have a uh, a column up forward uh, that would serve the same purpose. There, uh, there's a search light. There's a whistle on that column. Um, I don't know the the exact name of the mask, but uh, yeah, it, it would ser serve the same purpose. But it's not a steering pole like the uh, old classic steamers have. Okay. And I think we are out of questions. And I want to thank you um, for for getting back. I also want to yeah. thank all of the the people in our audience who stuck with us through that uh, technical snafu. And uh, hopefully Eric and Chrissy can put together some highlights of the Oberstar's engine room that were uh, a little hard to do with the dodgy Wi-Fi. And I will uh, mention that the whole chat has been filled with appreciation and thanks for both of you for doing this program. Oh, thank you. Thank Happy you, everyone. Happy to be here. Bye. Oh, one, another question here. Stuart is asking, why do older vessels have bow pilot houses and newer ones have a stern pilot house? It is a lot uh, cheaper construction only to have one house because you have half the half the piping, half the electrical work. Um, I can't think of why they would make a, a two house boat uh, anymore, but um, um, yeah, that's that's all I can tell you from that. And and your crew live on both ends. Oh yes, yeah. The uh, the most people that lit, that work up forward, you have the captain, uh, three mates, three wheelsmen, and the deckhands live up forward. Uh, the engine room and uh, galley staff typically live back aft. All right. Oh, except on the court. That's uh, everybody lives up forward on the court. <laughs> That's got to be kind of strange. It is, and you have to walk to work. Uh, when you work in the engine room and it uh, gets pretty nasty out on deck. Okay. Do you have another way to get to the engine room besides out on deck when it gets nasty? Uh, you can take the unloading tunnel on the court. It doesn't have uh, storm tunnels or walking tunnels like the uh, steamers have. Um, but uh, the unloading tunnel is uh, very small on that ship and uh, it's not very uh, user friendly. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Have a good day.